Welcome everyone to this session on From Permission to Publication. Um, we're going to be looking at managing third party materials in open access books. And I'm really glad that we've got this session up and running, particularly glad that we've got four fantastic speakers along with us. Um, I think it's going to be a really useful um, and in-depth exploration of an essential topic. So uh, I'm very excited and I hope you are too. Um, the session is being co-organised uh, by the Open Access Books Network and by uh, University of London Press and my colleague Paula Kennedy at University of London Press. So we're just going to briefly say who we are um, and why we're interested in this issue uh, before we introduce our speakers and kick off the event. So the Open Access Books Network um, brings together a community of different people interested in, in open access books in different aspects. So we try to be um, an open network that uh, shares resources, um, puts out blog posts, hosts events like this one, um, and generally tries to foster discussion and exploration around open access books. We're coordinated by members of OAPEN, Open Book Publishers uh, and Spark Europe. Um, and we're an Opera SIG, which means that we benefit from the, the Opera uh, infrastructure and network as well. Um, we cover a number of different topics, and as I said, everything that we do is uh, freely open and accessible um, for everyone to be involved with. So if you find today useful and you want to find out more about open access books, um, the OABN is very much uh, a good place to, to continue exploring. Um, and I'm just going to drop some links in the chat to where you can stay in touch with us, our website, our mailing list, and our uh, very new Blue Sky account, which uh, I do encourage you to join. And now I'll just briefly hand over to Paula. Uh, to talk about the University of London Press. Okay, thanks, Lucy, and welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along today. So I'm Paula Kennedy. I'm Head of Publishing at the University of London Press, an award-winning, predominantly open access publisher. We're part of the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, a national centre for advancing the humanities in the UK. My colleague, Emma Gallen, will talk a bit about what we publish in a moment. So this is just a very quick overview of our mission and why we've jointly developed this webinar today with the Open Access Books Network. Unlike other university presses, we have a unique remit in service of the arts and humanities. This influences our publishing programme um, and our work in offering a space for experimental publishing models for humanities books. Our mission is to open up humanities research. Open access is a key part of this and our books demonstrate many of the benefits of open access publishing including reaching non-academic and much more globally diverse audiences, for example. But we do know that many researchers and universities still need guidance and support when thinking about open access books, particularly around obtaining permissions for third party materials. In the UK this year, we saw a fair bit of confusion and some misperceptions during the REF OA books consultation. And from my own career in academic publishing spanning the last 20 years or so, I know that managing third party materials has always been an area where authors really value help. We've developed this webinar today to try to offer some support through what we hope will be a practical and useful session for everyone, featuring a fantastic lineup of speakers. I know that today we have attendees, including academics, librarians, funders, publishers, and those working in museums and archives, which I think shows what an important topic this is for many groups. I also wanted to quickly mention that our press website has a useful training hub section. This features free resources and recordings of the publishing related training sessions that we run each year on topics including open access and peer review, amongst others. We'll add a recording of today's session there after the event. If you'd like to find out more about us, I'll drop a link in the chat to our press website, which features more information about our history and mission, our books, and our publishing partnerships. Finally, we're also a member of the Open Institutional Publishing Association that someone's already mentioned in the chat, OIPA. This is a new network connecting publishing operations affiliated with UK universities. Members include Scottish Universities Press and LSE Press. And I wanted to mention this as university-based publishers can also be a really helpful source of support for academics about permissions and other topics. If you're looking for guidance, do see if your university has any kind of publishing operation and contact them if you're looking for help. I'll hand back to Lucy now, but I just wanted to say we're really grateful to the excellent panel of speakers today for sharing your time and your insights with us. and really hope that you all find this a useful session. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paula. Um, and yeah, we hope that today is going to be really useful, both in uh, providing support and in terms of some of the issues that come up around this uh, topic, but also potentially in tackling some myths or misunderstandings around it as well. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, so just in terms of the rough outline, um, we're going to hear from each of our speakers for about 10 minutes. Um, then we're going to have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, although, as I mentioned, if questions occur to you while somebody's speaking, um, please just drop them in the chat. And um, if it's a, a specific 
question that speaker can address. I might ask them to do that after they've uh, finished their section. Um, but in any case, we'll have a Q&A section after everybody has finished speaking um, and hopefully get a bit of discussion going. And then uh, a final section, I'm going to be asking the audience a little bit um, for some more of your thoughts and perspectives on this issue. Um, we really like to understand a bit more about where the particular pain points are, um, where you currently get um, advice and information about this issue, um, and a few other questions, which I'll come to at that point. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, so our speakers, um, really excited, as uh, Paula has said, to have this great lineup of speakers today. Um, and they're all representing a slightly different uh, sort of, I suppose, stakeholder group or um, outlook on this question, different experiences with this with this topic. So we have Professor Jan Zorkowski, who's the Arthur Kingsley Porter Professor of Medieval Latin at Harvard University. And Jan's going to be talking more from the kind of author perspective as somebody with, an ex with experience of publishing um, open access books with many, many uh, images inside them. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Emma Gallen, who's one of Paula's colleagues, a publisher at the University of London Press, who will be addressing this from the press perspective. Um, Professor Emily Hudson from the Faculty of Law and the Queen's College, University of Oxford, will talk more to the sort of specific legal questions around copyright um, and sharing third party materials and open access books. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Aaron Rees at the University of Leeds, um, and who's also part of the Towards a National Collection Project and the Museum Data Service, will talk about um, open resources that exist, uh, so, you know, particularly thinking about the work being done in the open GLAM sector, uh, GLAM standing for galleries, libraries, archives and museums, um, and what material is already out there, because certainly in my experience at Open Book Publishers, I found that authors aren't always aware that there is a wealth of openly available material, um, as well as material that might be um, more difficult to share. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to getting into that as well. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, um, I'm sharing slides, so I will do a little bit of wrangling uh, with my slide deck. Uh, let me just find the right one. Okay, uh, Jan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight and an honor to participate in this shindig on managing third-party materials in open access books. The remit for my 10 minutes is to offer an author's perspective by way of background, I'm a professor with a passion for medieval literature. Since 1981, I've been at Harvard. For the first 10 years, I employed images almost exclusively in special lectures. In the second decade, I sought systematically in teaching to integrate text and images and thereby to convey arguments both visually and verbally. By the mid 90s of the last millennium, I relied regularly on two slide projectors. I was primed for PowerPoint when it finally arrived. Um, but despite long habit in lecturing and later teaching, I hardly ever incorporated figures into published scholarship. Presses were not encouraging. The cost of paper, printing, layout, and permissions posed powerful disincentives. My books were mostly text only, and none included more than two dozen images. The situation frustrated me. As a pedagogue, I was keenly aware that students read fewer and fewer pages and that they achieved cognition ever more through images, maps, diagrams, and graphs, and not just words. Additionally, in the late 2000s, my perspectives shifted to di directing Dumbarton Oaks, an institute in Washington, DC. This research facility has, among other things, a museum, library, archives, specialized collections, publications, and a garden. Uh, if I could have the next image, please. Let's see. Oop. Sorry, uh, the very beautiful image was slightly masking uh, the buttons that I need to control the uh, oh, slides. Okay. So let okay. me just reshare. I'm happy to see this happens to other people and not merely from my generation. So oh, thank you. Still doing it. Uh, so uh, 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 around um, 2015, I blew a fuse with the status quo in publishing. And instead, I decided to draw inspiration from the 
crooner nicknamed chairman of the board and old blue eyes. I, I wanted to say, along with uh, Frank Sinatra, that I did it my way. And that decision meant including images. Simultaneously, I tapped original primary sources more heavily than ever before. I, I went crazy. Uh, and if I could have the next one um, after that one, thank you. Um, the, the project of most relevance here took its primary form in six volumes published by Open Book Publishers in 2018 as The Juggler of Notre Dame. And you can see it there on the left. Uh, this book was complemented in 2022 by reading The Juggler of Notre Dame. And then if I could have the next slide, uh, flanking them, were other publications to accompany an exhibit. These included two translations of Anatole France's short story as illustrated in 1906 and 1924, a reprint of a children's book by Barbara Cooney, a coloring book, a reprint of a short story in Spanish, a translation from German, and an exhibition booklet. And if I could have the next, the six volume book contains 1467 images adding the 55 in the anthology produces the grand total of 1522 the organizers asked me to address the question and if i could have the next one how important were third party materials the answer couldn't be simpler, indispensable. I conceived and produced the whole for the interplay between text and image. Removal of illustrations could not be imagined any more than presentation of the text alone from an illustrated children's book or from a manga paperback. The book was designed so that images did not merely illustrate words but carried forward arguments. Another question I've been asked to answer is, what was the process for obtaining image rights? A full response would run far too long. In brief, I thought hard about copyright term and public domain. The years 1923 to 1924 became my mantra. My subject lent itself to that cutoff in all the search engines, I sought out illustrated books, postcards, and other ephemera that were out of copyright. To ensure that rights were crystal clear, I purchased the items outright very cheaply whenever I could, and then made digital surrogates with the highest possible resolution. At that point, the prices were reasonable usually a pittance, in fact. I also spent a lot of time corresponding with archivists. God bless them. My objective was not to have to pay through commercial services what could be found elsewhere. And now far more has become freely accessible through, just to take the most obvious example, Wikimedia Commons and other resources. Next, came meticulous records with a system for archiving originals and surrogates. Each item was assigned a four digit number and stored in acid free folders when I owned it physically. Metadata were entered into a spreadsheet where records on expenses and permissions could be lodged. I had help and support for part of the time from a recent graduate of Harvard who established and maintained a simple but impeccable taxonomy. In other cases, I negotiated with individuals and entities for permission. Artists are usually quick. Only one out of dozens refused me. Sometimes I made memorable connections and even lasting friendships. Big delays were caused only when the artists were represented 
by estates. Even so, they too came through almost without exception. My tack has always been honesty. I don't have loads of money. My objective is not profit making and inclusion will keep alive the names and work of those who produce the originals. It's urgent to begin early, to be polite, to write often, but not irritatingly so, and to keep copious records. Archives have often been concerned with understandable punctilio about not being able to identify and secure permissions from photographers or individuals from decades ago. Generally, they've released materials so long as someone else, meaning in this case, yours truly, would assume responsibility against the highly unlikely event that anyone took offense and requested the images be removed. My absolute last resort has been commercial sites, though I have used them. Other problems. Occasionally, companies have been unwilling to allow reproduction of products. That can be frustrating, but not unsolvable. If I could have the next image. One concrete example. I wanted to include a magazine cover that had provoked a scandal a photo of a scantily clad model named Maria, who was posed to create a blasphemous parallel to the Virgin Mary. Playboy, which controlled the rights to the Mexican Playboy, in which it appeared, would not permit use of the image, but I tracked down a representation of it in a news photo. That allowed use. Fewer than a half dozen images were priced prohibitively. Some images were openly licensed, and since then, the number has only soared. The only times a designer was required was for redrawing images that were copyright clear, but as screenshots too low in resolution, if I could have the next. That would be the example that would be the case, for example, with uh, Google engrams. To sum up, it's entirely possible to use many third party materials. The easiest approach is to locate ones that are copyright clear. And after that is to secure ones that are copyrighted, but that are free or low cost. Even ones that require payment don't need to break the bank. The key paradoxically for digital publication is having a clear paper trail. I thank you for hearing me out, wish you the best of luck, and express my gratitude to the good souls of the open access community for living up to their values. I don't know how they do it, but I admire them hugely for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And uh, apologies for the uh, slight problem with the slide sharing at one point. It reassured um, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to have done that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, so we will move on to Emma. Um, and again, I am sharing slides, so wish me and Emma luck. Uh, okay, hopefully you can see those. Emma, would you like to take it away? Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lucy. And. Um, Thanks to Lucy and Paula for putting this webinar together. I'm hoping it's going to be a really useful session today. Um, so I'm Emma Gallen. I'm the publisher at the University of London Press, and my role involves looking after the editorial side of things at the press. And I've been here for about three and a half years now. I'm going to speak to you today about using third party materials in open access books from the publishing perspective. I'm going to talk quite transparently about our processes, some of the challenges we come across and the ways that we handle them, and some of the aspects that are normally, normally less challenging than they might actually appear to be on the surface. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. 
So just a little bit of background first. Um, so as Paula said, the press is based within the School of Advanced Study at the University of London in the UK. We're a predominantly open access press and almost 80% of the books that we publish are open access, primarily funded without author facing book processing charges to the support we receive from the school and through other collective institutional funding initiatives. Our publishing programme is focused on the humanities and we publish around 20 new books per year. So given the nature of the humanities subjects that we publish in, including third party material is a really important and often essential part of those books that we publish. So for example, for history authors that are engaging with photographs as primary historical sources, or for literary studies scholars um, carrying out close analysis of passages from novels or poems. I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and around three quarters of the open access books that we've published have included third party illustrations. So that really is quite a good proportion. And a handful of our books have also contained um, third party text extracts requiring permission from right holders. So things like long poetry quotations and epigraphs. Next slide, please, Lucy. So we aim to have quite a clear process for authors that are planning to use third party material in their books. And we support authors with this from the very early proposal development stages right through to publication. So it's our expectation that authors will be responsible for clearing the rights to re reuse any third party material that's in copyright in their book, which is fairly standard practice across academic publishing. And this includes responsibility for paying any reproduction fees involved, which can be charged by those licensing the material, either as a condition of the permission or in the case of images, so the author can obtain a high resolution copy. We make this requirement of authors really clear at the very outset in the book proposal form that all of our authors fill in, as this can really help them think about what third party content is really essential for them to use in the book and whether there are rights that will need to be cleared. Um, and this is you know, really important to think about as part of this early proposal development process. We then also reiterate our policy at the point that we offer, offer the author a publishing contract. And at that contract stage, we also send authors our author pack, which contains a substantial section on copyright permissions, covering the basics on copyright, the types of material that need permission and how to go about obtaining it, open access and copyright, and the specific rights that need to be cleared for our publishing requirements, including those extra considerations for this um, for open access books. Next slide, please. A really big part of our job is providing ad hoc support for authors as and when they or their copyright holders have questions while they're obtaining any necessary permissions prior to manuscript submission. Anecdotally, I'd probably say out of everything involved in kind of writing and preparing a book manuscript, this is probably the genre of questions that I get most frequently as an editor. Um, and editors regularly handle a huge variety of permissions related questions and situations. So authors, I think, should feel reasonably reassured that if there is anything you're unsure about, we've mostly seen it all. So really don't hesitate to ask your editor, uh, your editor if you have any copyright questions along the way. Um, and so then the next stage in the process, we will ask authors to submit all the written permissions they have as part of their final manuscript package submission. And that's where Jan's point about uh, keeping a clear paper trail is really important. Um, and we carry out very thorough checks to make sure that we have all the necessary permissions in place for the rights that we require, including for open access publication, and that the material has been given the correct attribution in the manuscript. And we won't hand over a manuscript to production until any outstanding permission issues are resolved. I also just want to flag a couple of policy points that we follow. So our open access books are all published under a Creative Commons license, normally CC BY and C and D, which means that any reuse of the book must give attribution to the original author. The reuse must be non-commercial and not a derivative use, so not used in a modified form. However, we don't ask that third party rights holders license their material under that same Creative Commons license in the book. They can if they like, um, or they can choose to license them under a more permissive CC license if they also choose, but they can opt to reserve all rights to the material, which is what most right holders tend to do in my experience. And the particular copyright notice that is relevant to that image or that extract will be included alongside the extract. We have a statement in the book's front matter that makes it clear that third party material included in the book isn't covered by the same CC license as the book. 
really the main thing I would tell authors is that copyright holders should really just be aware that the book will be published open access when approaching them for permission and that you obtain their permission to be included in an open access publication, but their material itself doesn't have to be open access. So we also rely in some circumstances on the UK fair dealing copyright exception that exists for use of material for the purposes of criticism and review without needing to seek permission. So the law doesn't define the type or how much material can be used under fair dealing and suggests only that the usage should be reasonable, acknowledging that this will vary on a case by case basis and that it shouldn't cause the original rights holder to lose revenue. We currently apply this relatively conservatively, I think, at the University of London Press. Um, so in line with some, but not all academic presses, we only consider fair dealing for text quotations and not for most images. The only images we might consider as fair dealing, depending on the circumstances, are um, screen captures or film stills, as they in no way represent a substitute for a whole film and therefore fair dealing feels fairly reasonable. For text extracts, it's our policy not to specify the number of words an author can quote under fair dealing, but we advise that it shouldn't be a substantial portion of the whole. And we check this carefully um, on a case by case basis in our editorial work on the manuscript. On fair dealing and open access specifically, on the one hand, I'm conscious that the free dissemination of books means that they have the potential to reach a much wider audience than kind of a limited number of printed hardbacks would. And that may or may not have an impact on what could be interpreted as fair reuse of the material under UK law. And I haven't on the other hand, but I will get to that a little bit later. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So I'll now run quickly through a few common issues that come up, but Firstly, I really want to emphasize the hopefully reassuring fact that across all of the open access books that I've worked on in the last three and a half years since joining an open access press, no copyright holder has ever refused permission for an image to be included in the book because it was being published open access. So the process of obtaining permission can be difficult. It can be time consuming in all sorts of ways. I really don't want to sugarcoat that, but I do feel like a bit of a narrative is potentially circulating that it's somehow more difficult to get permission to use images in open access publications. And there may well be instances of that, but it's not something I have um, firsthand evidence of in my experience. Something that can be an issue is the potential for greater permission fees involved for open access books. And permission fees can be a barrier. We acknowledge this for authors, particularly in the humanities where the need to include third party material to preserve uh, the integrity of the research is high, but the likelihood of having research funds to cover any costs is, is much lower. So this issue is a result of the model that many image licensing institutions use to calculate permission fees, which is based on the print run or the number of copies printed of the book. And it's also obviously very outdated in this age of digital publication and indeed print on demand publication, never mind open access. So previously this model has worked quite well for academic publishing. So if your monographs print run was only going to be a couple of hundred copies say, and for a specialist academic use, largely selling to libraries only, in contrast with say a trade book for general interest audience that might have a run of thousands of copies and generate more profit from sales. It was quite fair for a gallery or museum to charge an appropriately reduced permission fee for use of third party material in the monograph. Now with open access or for any kind of ebook publication for that matter, it's almost impossible to put a number to a print, print run when asked. And the goal of open access really is to increase readership. So an unlimited license is really what authors need to ask for, which can occasionally come with much higher costs through some rights holders. However, the use is still primarily specialist and scholarly. And we as publishers and the authors aren't making any money from the book's open access availability. We're not financially profit profiting from the images use. So the old model is really no longer fit for purpose. In an ideal world, I'd personally be in favor of more institutions moving away from this model and perhaps linking fee rates solely to the intended usage, e.g. scholarly versus trade, or, and um, here's where I get to my other hand, on fair dealing, um, perhaps a more permissive convention around fair dealing for use of images in the context of academic research dissemination could be built up, uh, particularly for those books which are being published openly as a non-profit public good. Um, 
there is terrific work being done and loads of progress being made, especially by GLAM institutions in open access provision of GLAM resources. One issue with reproducing open third party content, you know, images that have been licensed under an open access license, is where material has been made available under a license that specifies non-commercial use only. As there's a little bit of a question mark over whether our books count as commercial or non-commercial, as we also sell print editions of our open access books. So the Creative Commons have left their def definition purposefully open to interpretation, describing commercial use as directed toward commercial advantage on monetary compensation. So the sales of the print copies of our open access books do compensate us for a portion of our book production costs, which could certainly be argued as commercial use under that definition. And currently we do ask authors to obtain permission to reproduce material available under a non-commercial license in our books. However, again, we don't make a profit from print sales and I'd love to see more clarity around this and ideally specific exemptions from the definition of commercial for the print versions of open access research publications uh, from Creative Commons and from institutions engaging with Open Glam. But I'll just end by saying that the main third party material issues in my experience, and I think there's, there's one more bullet point there, Lucy, perfect. Um, uh, to do with non-responsive copyright holders or difficulty of tracing copyright holders. And this issue isn't specific to open access books. It can happen with all publication types. And that's really the theme that I want to pull out again from my talk. There are certainly challenges involved in using third party material in publications, but there's very little that's inherently more challenging about this for open access books. And a wide variety of support is always available. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emma. I'm going to stop sharing um, and just see if we've got questions. Ah, there are a couple of questions um, for Jan, in fact. So uh, people are obviously thinking about what you said, Jan, I've come up with some questions for you. Um, so you sound like an exemplary author when it comes to sourcing images and clearing permissions, but you don't seem to have touched on the specific issue of open access permissions. How have you found clearing those? So the, um, the, the, the difference that I noticed was the one to which uh, Emma referred, uh, namely uncertainty among those controlling the rights about exactly what open access entailed. And so I found that uh, that often added one um, round of emailing with them to explain what what the consequences of open access would be. And honestly, in all of those um, negotiations, I only can remember losing a single image uh, by, and it was by an artist who had been burned once when, um, one of her images had uh, fallen into the hands of people who used it uh, not to her liking in, um, in in Asia. And she just had developed a policy of not providing uh, sufficiently high resolution images for reproduction as a result of that experience. But I had thousands of Inter exchanges, and that was the only time that that happened. So the short answer, it adds a stage in explaining something about what open access is, but uh, it really doesn't uh, diminish the willingness of um, artists and authors to grant rights. Thank you very much. And then drawing on something that Emma was talking about as well, Jennifer asks Jan, did you consider whether fair use might apply? If not, was this your choice or not allowed by the publisher? Uh, so for the, the issue of fair use came up um, with um, li literary text and uh, it's partic particularly a problem with poetry and uh, again, um, I found that most of the, almost all of the people that I dealt with were willing, when I explained the situation, when I made the case for 
greater promulgation of their work, they were uh, they ended up granting permission uh, either with their usual fee or very often with with none at all. There can be problems with uh, big name authors. I for I I won't uh, cite any names here, but I can tell you that in one case. Um, I devoted considerable creative thought to figuring out how I could obtain a uh, use of full lyric poems when the um, fees being asked seemed to me um, seemed to me prohibitive. And two cases where it turned out that there was a means of obtaining rights that achieved the end that meant something to me. Uh, in one case, I was able to get permission to reproduce a broadside that included the text plus um, artistic images. And so I was able to reproduce the broadside, which, which would enable people to read the text, which was my intention uh without having to uh pay for the use of the words separate from the broadside uh which would have been the other approach and then in another case which which uh has not come into publication yet i was able to secure the rights to embed in as a file within the publication a live reading by the poet of the poem and and uh it took a, a a fair amount of negotiation with different entities that controlled the recording but they in the end granted it whereas i wasn't able to uh get rights to the um text of the poem for printing but those are those are really isolated special cases and they're actually meant as encouragement to say that there are ways to figure out so that you're abiding uh, by the letter of the law, which is absolutely <laughs> essential. Um, it, but but you're you're uh, facilitating access to the material. Just one um, one one last point is that is and and I, I believe that Emma touched on this very frequently you'll get in situations where there's material that is in effect uh stranded um it's out there and but you cannot find out who now actually controls the rights to it this is the argument in favor of starting early and keeping very clear records of, of what you do, because you need to get out there and to look for descendants of the person who produced the material. You need to write to uh, whatever company may have existed once upon a time that uh, published or released the material. You, you just need to cover your bases by making all the good faith approaches that you that you can but if you're dealing with older material sometimes you'll you, what you'll run into is just a string of dead ends uh, but so long as you document that you that you've tried uh that that is what the law requires because the 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 law is meant to uh be um uh, in the end reasonable to protect the right holders, but also to enable life to go on. So keep those records. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jan. And that's a good transition to our next speaker, um, Emily, who's going to speak to this, the more sort of legal angle. Um, Emily, would you like to go for it? Yes, I would. So I'll start by getting my slides up. Um, and I should say that Emma did a fantastic job and I have been changing my presentation on the fly. So what you're about to hear was not what I um, uh, actually expected to say, 
Um, but Emma did such a thorough and fantastic job. Um, so my name is Emily Hudson and um, I'm up at the University of Oxford and uh, was involved with a number of colleagues, including Claire Painter, who's in the audience today, on providing some advice to uh, UKRI in relation to a change to its open access policy that took place earlier this in year, earlier this year, I should say, in which it extended its OA requirement to long form outputs. So we provided some um, advice to UK, UKRI and they've then uh, released um, some guidance in relation to various things, including the handling of third party copyright. So in addition to my research on copyright, generally, um, this has uh, been a project I've been involved with recently, and I certainly can say a few words about the UKRI open access policy. Um, but I thought I'd just um, start by drawing um, from a few points that that Claire and Tanya Applin and myself um, made in the sort of, in the guidance we gave to UKRI about uh, third party rights. But then I thought I might talk about copyright exceptions um, and pick up the point that Emma made in relation to better use of exceptions. So I'm, I'm really gonna pivot into that direction because I think that with the content on this slide, I think I think this really does tally with, with what Emma said that the process of clearing rights for OA outputs is essentially the same as traditional outputs. So everything you need to do in terms of determining the rights holder for the third party content you wish to use, contact, contacting that person if you uh, have formed the view that you need to ask permission, requesting a permission, paying any necessary fees, that general process is the same. That said, where there might be a difference, and I think Emma picked up on this, is in the content of the license that you'll seek. And that that license needs to ensure um, or needs to cover the um, OA environment in which the app will be made available. So traditional approach to approaches to licensing where you might ask for a particular territory, a particular print run, a particular duration, they just don't map onto OA. So that's why you need a license that's broader. Uh, what we have suggested in our guidance is worldwide territory, no time limit, not tied to things like print runs or maximum downloads and so forth. A second thing you'll need to determine is how the third party content is presented. And what I mean by that is the copyright terms under which it is presented. So is it being presented on an all rights reserved basis or itself subject to the same open license as the rest of the, uh, uh, the, the output or indeed a different open license? And um, I think the point's already been made and it's a very uh, important one that just because content appears in an OA publication does not mean that itself, uh, that it, that content itself needs to be subject to the same license. And indeed, I think that um, there will be a lot of rights holders who um, would simply refuse a license if you uh, uh, ask for the their content to be made available under the same open license or will charge an incredibly high license fee. The reason why you don't need that third party content to be subject to the same open license is because there's sort of two steps in um, uh, in the process of a downstream. Oh, let me start that again. The reason why you don't need the third party content to be subject to the same open license is because you've already got permission for that content to appear in your book. So what the, in a traditional environment, what the rights holder is saying is you may use my content in your book and they want to find out about how your book's going to be made available to the public. Same thing happens in OA. Um, the question of whether that rights holder provides a license which allows downstream acts 
is entirely separate. So they do not need to license downstream acts in order to grant a permission for the content to appear in your work. Um, and so you can have all rights reserved content um, um, in your book. And I think one of the things that is important though, and which I think Emma uh, referred to, is the need to make sure that the that any third party content is flagged accordingly so that users know that if they're going to reuse um, any content in that publication that the open license does not extend to that to that content. Um, I think one thing to perhaps think about too is the question of how to proceed if you've got third party content and you can't license it. Um, and got a few um, possibilities on um, this slide. Now, the most straightforward thing is to remove it. Another possibility is to substitute that content with material for which uh, permission is either not required or easier to obtain. So for instance, material that is genuinely in the public domain, and I've put genuinely in italics because there can be a slippage in the use of the term public domain so that it refers to the public sphere. So e.g. I found this on the internet um, and it's in the public domain and therefore I may use it in my book. There is no founded on the internet defence um, and in that context, the word public domain actually means public sphere. The public domain as a copyright term of art means material that is not protected by copyright. So that might be because copyright has expired. It might be because um, it was never protected uh, by copyright to begin with. Um, and some of the rules in relation to, uh, well, the rules in relation to duration differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so Jan was talking about the US experience and some of the key US dates. Just bear in mind that uh, UK rules about duration are, um, are different. Um, other options, tombstoning and linking, um, I think probably uh, publishers can speak more to whether they find, and authors can speak more to whether tombstoning is a desirable um, um, option in OA publications. My my sense from speaking with with publishers is that they try to avoid it, so that you don't have um, the non OA and the OA version that that look uh, different. Um, but I wanted just to perhaps just speak to exceptions um, um, and the idea that sort of Emma raised about whether we could do more with exceptions. <clears throat> um, so. Um, my sense is that um, in terms of when publishers are thinking about fair dealing arguments, that they are thinking about it um, for images and illustrations and less so for integrated quotes. And I just want to expand on that because I think Emma said something a little bit different. I just want, I actually think we probably do agree, but I just want to explain this. Um, so just a step back a moment. So if a fair dealing argument applies, it means that you don't need to request permission from the rights holder to use that third party content and you don't need to pay them any money. And there are a number of different fair dealing exceptions in the copyright statute. As indicated on the slide, I think the ones that are going to be most useful for OA publication are quotation, criticism and review. Now, my point about publishers not thinking about fair dealing for integrated quotes related to the idea that in academic publications, we're quoting from one another all the time. Um, and yet I don't think that when you've got a text quote that is embodied in a paragraph, that publishers would tend to look at that and say that's something that needs to be cleared. I think what they might do, and this might be Emma's point, is when you've got text that sits as a separate quote, so it's actually in its own paragraph, it's in a box, it's an extensive quote, I think they might think about fair dealing there. But just for the quotes that you include in the text, 
I think that it's just standard academic practice to quote and nobody is thinking about whether or not you need rights clearance for those sorts of quotes. So when I so so I think that what we have is in in terms of where people think that there's a sort of difficult line, my sense is that for images there are quest there are questions about the, the, the sort of publishers struggling with the question about when fair dealing can apply. For integrated quotes, they're not thinking about it at all. And for other longer quotes, they've got various rules of thumb for when they'll seek permission and and when they won't. Um. In terms of quotation arguments, and this is, uh, I've, I've got on here the text of the slide, uh, the text of the uh, quotation exception. Um, I think that um, there are um, some things just to point out from this, from this statutory language. And one is that quotation does not just apply to text-based works. So that is, although you might think about quotation in the context of some text with quotation marks, in fact, it clearly applies to all types of copyright work, and that includes images. And indeed, we have case law to make it absolutely clear, uh, and this is the uh, Painter and uh, uh, then um, Pelham and Spiegel Online decisions, that you can a quotation can comprise an entire work. It can apply to any type of copyright work. So you can have a quotation, which is the entirety of an image. Um, actually, I might uh, sit on this page. Um, that said, the use must still be proportionate and accord with fair practice. So I think one thing to think about whenever you're you're considering fair dealing arguments is a proportionality point. So you're not using an image that is bigger than necessary. You're not. Um, so you. Uh, I think too with the definition of quotation that the image needs to be connected to a point that's being made. So there needs to be some intellectual connection between the, the, the image and the point in the work. So that is, I would not be using quotation for merely decorative things. And certainly if you're thinking about front covers or um, um, front cover clearly wouldn't, I, I, don't, I don't think you could argue quotation for a sort of decorative cover on a coffee table book um, in the way that it might be applicable when you're inside the book um, uh, and the image is connected to a point being made um, by that by that author. Um, um, and I think too um, that in term, and I think this is also sorry, I did not plan to do this at all. So I'm just just coming through. But this is this is the final slide I've I've got is just that um, um, the 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 point in this final bullet point about lack of competition. I think this is a, a another thing that, that you might bear in, in mind in, as, as well in terms of uh, thinking about fairness arguments, that it's not just the amount taken, but also that, that it doesn't substitute for the source work. So if you're doing a sort of literary criticism, that, that there might be quite extensive quotes, but ultimately there is, um, they're being made in the context of uh, criticism being made, they wouldn't substitute the source work um, and, and so forth. So that's all I might say for now. And I'll wait and see if we've got any questions. Thanks very much, Emily. And thanks for um, sort of responding live, as it were, to what the speakers um, said before you. That's really appreciated. We have had some discussion of tombstoning in the chat, um, but I think I'm right in saying that the, the question asked about it has been answered. It was more kind of what is tomb tombstoning. And uh, there are a couple of examples that have been shared there. Um, so, um, Aaron, um, without further ado, I'd like to hand on to you, please. Can you see that presentation now? Just making sure I've shared the right part of it. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Perfect. Great. So, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, really interesting so far. I'm learning loads. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm Aaron Reese, and I'm interested now in talking a little bit about cultural heritage. Um, so GLAM data and OA practices. Um, so I've, I've worked as a curator and a collections manager in the past uh, in museums. Uh, then I did a PhD in digital museology, and then I worked on uh, one of the large towards national collection programs and now work on the museum data service. So I think I've, I've moved between being a practitioner in museums in the glam sector to academia, and then now I sit somewhere in the middle, kind of trying to balance the two quite nicely. So hopefully I've got a little bit of a, a, a different overview here. Um, so I am coming to you thinking about the cultural sector. Um, there is a big open glam movement um, and there are other parts to that, like collections of data that are really developing well in large cultural heritage collections. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do in building in the principles and practices of open glam across a full range and scale of different glam organisations. So I think we, we did define glam at the start, but I'll just do it again. It's galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Um, and there's a whole row range of kind of heritage organizations that fall between those cracks as well and I don't think GLAM really accounts for that but there's community community heritage practices that produce a huge amount of interesting material and we shouldn't forget about those as well. Um, so the open GLAM movement is really at the core of a lot of more specific initiatives that are trying to develop open use of cultural heritage materials. Um, it is a community of practitioners and policymakers who want to advocate for open access and help organisations and the people who work within those organisations navigate their way towards doing that. Um, the Open Glam website has a really amazing list of Glam organisations that have open access policies, and that includes lists of the types of tools they have that allow you to access that material as well. Um, I would recommend going to have a look at that if you're thinking about how you might use some cultural heritage materials. Um, but I think a major element of Open Glam is, is being transparent. Um, and that is sometimes hard to do with the best of wills in these kind of large multi-generational organisations like museums, libraries and archives. Um, it's not as clear cut as to say that large institutions are able to do open glam better than small institutions. Um, however, as we've already heard today, uh, keeping clear records of what exists and who owns the rights to them um, is a really key part of how to make materials open access. And despite cataloging being a core part of what all glam institutions do, there's a surprising amount of data and information that's locked away in ways that aren't easily accessible and make it hard for already stretched curators, archivists and librarians to make that data available. So we've got to think about the resources that, that it takes in, to make GLAM material accessible as well. So being clear about what can be used and under what circumstances is key. And I'm going to briefly talk about two examples based on my experience over the past couple of years. And um, what I'll be doing slightly differently to, I suppose, some of the other uh, speakers is I'm going to focus on data um, rather than specifically images. So I'll, I'll touch on images. Um, but I'm doing this from the perspective of working on one of the Tours National Collection programs, uh, the Congress Engine project, that is, and then on the Museum Data Service, which launched in September. Um, I'm just going to be making the case for how we can use data in some of our open access publishing as well. So what is TANK and what are they trying to do? So first of all, TANK is the Towards the National Collection Programme, which is a UKRI HRC funded multi-year 18 million pound, something like that, investment in the GLAM sector, seeking to understand the potential routes and approaches that might be needed to create a united digital collection for the UK. So they've run through a series of cross-cutting commissioned reports, a group of foundation projects and then a series of discovery projects and tomorrow i am going to the final tank conference in manchester where and then on thursday we'll be launching the recommendations from the from the whole program so they're all coming towards an end now um so i worked on congruence engine and that's one of the main discovery projects uh led by the science museum group um and 
I got involved in all sorts of bits and bobs as part of doing that. But I'm going to start at a tank level um, and then I'll go down to a kind of project level. So at a tank level, there's been a few different approaches to thinking about open access. Um, but a lot of it's coming from the kind of basic infrastructure that enables open access to be a possible route for organizations. Um, so one of the one of the foundation projects looked at persistent identifiers, the ways of making data available in an open and persisting way. So people can always go back to it, can reference it properly, because um, referencing cataloging catalog records in museums or libraries is quite difficult to do when it's not and kind of stored in a persistent way. Um, and then they've also done a project uh, called the Practical Applications of IIIF, which is about creating openly accessible, high resolution images um, and making those accessible and usable in an open access way as well. Um, so those reports are all available to, to look at. Some fantastic work has come from them. And then on, the Congress Engine project more specifically. Um, we've been working in an environment where collections data is already available to us in a mix of open access and not. So working in that environment and trying to understand ways to work with collections data, including the images, has been really interesting there. So uh, we can look at the Science Museum group as an example to start with. So they have their collections online. You can search them through a portal. Their metadata is available as CC0 license. Their images, what the ones they have, are also open to use. You can open them as IIIF manifests. You can look at them in great detail and there's clear licensing. So not all the images are released under a CC0 license. And that's important, I suppose, as a distinction when we're talking about collections, material, and third parties, and open access is that sometimes the metadata is available at an open access level, and the images are licensed at more restricted or semi-open access levels. Um, but the Science Museum makes all this very clear, very transparent, and that's also part of the kind of open glam movement is, even if you can't make all your material open access, it's about taking the steps towards semi-open access, making sure you understand what you can say and how you label that and make that clear for people to use. Um, so there we have the Science Museum as one example. But then we also worked with collections like Bradford Museums and Galleries. So they've got an absolutely incredible collection um, and they are open for collaboration. They're open as a museum to kind of share whatever they can with you, but they don't have a collections online. Um, so it's about, it's not about saying that because there isn't an open access policy for an organization, they're not open to working with you. Um, actually they are, they just don't have the infrastructure in place. They don't have the resources to be able to fund and maintain that kind of open access material approach. So I think we need to be generous with our organizations when we're trying to help them through open access. Um, because not all of them will have this kind of open glam approach when you first communicate with them, but most of them agree with those principles and will try and help you as far as they can. So whilst in Congress Engine, we haven't been able to kind of make all the data sets we're working with open access and fix the open access problem across a range of different glam organizations, we've been trying to work out ways to kind of get halfway um, so one of the things we've done is use uh, Wikibase, which is the kind of database software, or even if it's that, that uh, Wikidata and Wikipedia and all that run on. And um, we've been creating an open access register of data sets. So we're getting quite meta now. So instead of saying these are the data, this is the data, we're saying this is a record that the data exists and describes the data. So then we're starting to build in these different way, different layers to try and point to records and data sets, creating layers of open access before you get down to the individual data where you can start having one-to-one -one conversations where you can eventually get to that licensing level, um, but it may not be 
instantly accessible on, with a download button. We've also then been looking at things like um, creating paradata, so um, creating information about the intent of data sets, which can also be helpful when you're trying to understand what the licensing potential is of material. So if there is an intention that this data set was created to make the material more accessible, um, then you've got kind of already arguments as to why you might be able to make good licensing, kind of just have good licensing discussions with people. Um, so that's kind of some of the ways in which we've been trying to, to promote that work. I'm going to now quickly go on to the Museum Data Service, um, which is a new service that launched in September. So acknowledging that a lot of museum collections data is not readily available, um, it's not accessible, it's not machine readable, uh, the Museum Data Service is designed to be a service that facilitates the bringing together and servicing of museum data under Creative Commons licensing. Um, so it's designed to create fair data, so findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. Um, and we kind of do some light interoperability mapping in, in the data to make sure that the different data sets kind of speak to each other a little bit. Um, but the MDS doesn't deal with images. So again, that's why I'm trying to talk about data and how we can readily use collections data in, in our work. So it doesn't deal with images because there are so many practical kind of things to overcome here. Licensing of metadata. So when we're cataloging in museums, the, the metadata that's created by curators over generations and generations is all kind of protected by copyright as well. It's the museum's copyright, but the museums have the ability to make that openly accessible in a way that doesn't interact with other third party rights that might be inherently in the object. Um, so that's where we're kind of focusing our attention. Also, there's all sorts of costs of uh, storing images across the entire museum sector in one central place, which would be um, way too costly to try and manage at the moment. But we're starting with data, trying to create a more openly data and shareable kind of mentality within the museum sector, I suppose, is where we're trying to go with that. Um, but here, uh, the Museum Data Service has got about 3.7 million objects online now from about 80 different museums, having only launched in September. So um, we're already getting quite a, a long way in creating more usable sets of mat third party material um, for authors and for researchers to use. And then I'm just gonna quickly sum up and just kind of say what I think we could be doing next with third party materials uh, from cultural heritage organizations. Um, and that is to use existing material. Um, I think that museums, libraries and archives uh, are resource strapped organizations, um, as we all are, I know, but um, only through using the material that they've kind of worked hard to get out there, where they start seeing value in it and placing resource there. Um, so use that list from Open Glam, use Museum Data Service, use that type of material uh, and start using it in your in your publications. Um, that, that would be one big call. Um, deeper collaborations between these different types of organizations that aggregate and bring together different types of collections data and images. Um, so there's kind of the tank project, obviously, museum data service, and there's DISCO, which looks at, um, which is such a great acronym, but it looks at natural heritage, natural, um, natural history, sorry, archeology span data service, and then the heritage science data service as well, coming together and collaborating between those. And then I think the last and final one, which I think is most relevant here is a coordinated approach to images and digital assets. It's too big for one organization to take on. It's too big for a lot of small organizations to take on. As we've seen, they can't even get their kind of collections data online. They're not gonna be able to create big open access collections of 
of the images. So um, yeah, we definitely need some sort of coordinated approach from there. But that's it from me. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. And it's it's interesting what you're talking about there is, in, I think, in part, uh, encouraging a kind of cultural shift towards openness, both on the part of authors who, you know, could be more aware of open collections and use them more in the publications, and then also on the part of the cultural organisations themselves who may be sympathetic towards openness, but not ne yet necessarily proactively um, making their collections open as, as much yeah. as they could be. Yeah, exactly that. Beautiful yeah. synthesis of what I took a long time to say. <laughs> no, thank you. That was great. Um, we've got some conversation in the chat about licenses um, and I know Emily you may have to leave shortly so I don't know if you're able just to to touch on this um, but whether there's some concern around whether open licenses would be respected or not whether more restrictive licenses are more respected um, or whether in fact this is just an issue with you know if someone chooses not to respect a license it doesn't necessarily matter how restrictive that license is. Yeah I think that um the i think there's been some very fair points made in the in the chat that if people want to copy an entire work they may they may well do it anyway um and so the question is whether or not rights holders um might be more apprehensive about agreeing to have their material included in a a work that has a more permissive rather than more restrictive Creative Commons license? And um, that's an empirical question. Um, as I said in the chat, it's pointed out that just because something's got a uh, all rights reserve label doesn't mean that that somehow protects it from um, acts by third, by, by third parties. That said, I do think we need to bear in mind that there will be third parties who do want to uh, respect copyright law um, and I suppose there are some um, questions um, about whether with some of the outputs, whether there is a, a complexity in the rights information that is difficult for people to follow and just whether that concern would lead some rights holders to say, well, look, I, I, I can't be confident that a user will understand the difference between CC BY and CC BY in CND and all rights with them, and just whether or not that that causes any friction. That's an empirical question. I I I don't have have the answer that I think the publishers would be better placed to comment on it. I do think though that one matter that's come up in the chat, which I think is worth thinking about, is open access and um, AI, and the degree to which putting um, do, do, whether. Um, a CC BY license basically means that commercial um, uh, generative AI processes have actually been permitted by the uh, person who applies that license and whether that's how we want AI, uh, that's how we want OA outputs, I should say, to be used. Thanks, Emily. Um, does anybody else want to touch on that question from potentially the publisher side or...? I'm very conscious that AI is a is a session, a whole different session potentially, one that we could spend a lot of time talking about. I'll um, just be briefly to that. I mean, yes, the, we're all on a massive learning curve with AI at the moment, and there are no easy answers. Um, I think it was maybe Ross in the chat that mentioned that um, you know it doesn't just have to be under a very permissive license for an AI or anybody to to ignore what the terms of that license is. Um, so yes, at, at the moment that's, you know, it's, it's not impacting what licensing we're choosing for the books actively, but um, we're all learning more and more about uh, AI and how it's being trained as we're going. So we're just going to be keeping our ear to the ground and learning as much as we can as we go on and um, kind of communicating what's best for our books uh, with our authors as well. Thanks, Emma. Um, and I'm just trying to keep an eye on the chat to see if there are new questions, because I do have some questions for the audience as well. Um, and I think we may just have some time to get those in. So I'm going to um, share a Mentimeter presentation uh, just to wake everybody up a bit at the end. Um, Oh, hang on. Is that? Yeah. Okay. You can hopefully see the um, 
the joining instructions for the Mentimeter presentation. So you can either go online via menti.com and put that code in um, and join the, the questions that way, or you can use the QR code to scan directly um, on your phone, for example, and that can take you to the, um, to the presentation on your phone. Um, I'll just leave that up for a few seconds so people can, can join it. Okay, and the, the details are still at the top of each slide. Um, so I'm curious to know um, how you might describe yourself uh, looking at these categories. Obviously, some of you might belong to several of them, but choose the one that you feel is most applicable to you. And this will also help us, I think, with following up from, from this session, because one of the reasons that we wanted to ask you some questions before we all finish is because it, it's helpful to us to get an idea about how best to follow up this session, because I think it's been really rich and really interesting. Um, but also, even with 90 minutes, it's not nearly enough to sort of get to grips with these questions. So I think it's going to be really useful for us just to spend a little bit of time um, learning more about you um, and what you might want to learn more about in terms of follow up. OK. So the next slide, have you published an open access book um, or is it something that you're currently doing? Obviously you may not be an author, which is fine, but if you are, just let us know. I'm quite pleased by the proportions here. Hopefully those of you who are currently in the process of doing this are not hitting too many of these sticky situations. Okay. And this is maybe a slightly uh, cheeky question in some ways, just to see if anyone needs to vent some frustrations. Um, but what words come to mind when you think about securing permissions for third party content? So basically what I'm trying to get out here is, is it a frustrating experience? Is it, uh, you know, something that you find easy to navigate and simple? I'm guessing possibly not. Time consuming, tiring, important. Yeah. Time, tricky, frustrating, daunting. <laughs> Hassle, money. These are much more polite than some of the words I was expecting to get, so. Unresponsiveness. Yeah, I think that's on the publishing side, something that we sometimes find as well, that it can be difficult to, to hear from rights holders in a timely way. Cumbersome, responsibility. Complicated and time consuming seem to be key terms here. Complicated. Okay. And then I'm keen to know if you want to look for advice or support when you're dealing with this issue, who do you go to? Where do you go to? Are there resources? Are there websites? Are there people? You know, for example, might you speak to librarians or do you have do you do you seek legal advice even? Um, do you speak to your publishers? Do you speak to colleagues? Is it something that, that colleagues sort of share information about? Do scholarly societies help with this? Do you, do you hear from membership organisations like that? Okay, interesting. So it looks like people rely quite a lot on their publisher also on colleagues, including some named colleagues. I don't know if they're colleagues or just the, I know that Chris and Jane have both uh, found some information on this topic. Um, and institutions, it looks like to a certain degree as well, colleagues from the open access team, university copyright holder. The UKRI guide, UKRI guide, a shout out for that. The Authors Alliance. So quite a broad sweep of sources of information. 
which on the one hand is a good thing and on the other may be confusing and daunting in itself, I suppose. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm gonna go on to the next question. What resources do you use? So I suppose there's actually a bit of an overlap with the previous question, but are there particular resources? Um, for example, someone mentioned the UKRI guide um, or, okay, the Creative Commons website. There's another good one. Authors Alliance. I wonder if it's something we should set up on the Open Access uh, Books Network website as well, because we have pages aimed at particular stakeholders for, uh, which have lists of resources on them. For example, we have a page for authors, but we might think about um, resource pages for particular issues because it looks as though this one, again, there's a, there's a number of different resources that are coming up. Some of them I've not heard of, so I'm looking forward to digging into those. A central resource it would be useful. Yeah, I find with these kinds of things, you, you get a number of different collections of resources and, and no central resource. I'm sure there's an XKCD comic about that somewhere. Okay. I'm gonna go on to the next question which is what sources of open content do you know about or use? And I suppose images is perhaps the most obvious example. So that's why I've put that there, but um, you know, there may be other types of content as well that's openly available that you use. And I, I suppose for the purposes of this webinar, we are thinking most obviously about using for publication, but there is also other uses, of course, for example, using, using in research or in teaching. Um, so I suppose those sorts of resources uh, would also be useful here. Yeah, Wikimedia coming up a lot. Our world in data. Yeah, of course, open data, the big issue. Flickr, Art UK. <clears throat> Wary of free images, some are not easy to use for publication. Yeah, and I think that was a, a great point that Emily made, just because something is on the internet and you can access it freely on there does not mean that it is public domain to be reproduced in uh, other places. So we will be sharing all of these um, in our blog post roundup from this session, because I think this is really useful for um, other people to be able to, to know and find out about. And then what's not there that you think would help you? What's most needed to support authors with third party content in open access books? So somebody mentioned a sort of central resource um, for guidance and information. That's I suppose one thing that uh, there's not a kind of obvious place where everybody's gravitating to. We can see that from what people have already said. So FAQs, some kind of, yeah, frequently asked questions. We might think about that actually for the blog post, whether we can pull out some FAQ type, uh, FAQ type digest to some of the issues that have come up. Checklists and decision trees, written guidelines, help with fees, yeah. Help with fees or as Aaron's doing, trying to um, persuade institutions not to charge them, in fact, to open their collections. Yeah, more UK museums with policies that clearly allow academic reuse of materials. And I think that was really interesting, again, from what Adam Aaron was talking about, saying that it's not necessarily always the case that institutions don't want to be open with their collections. It's that they may not have thought deeply about the need to do so and how they might do so. I'm conscious of the time, I'm going to tick on to the final slide and that's I suppose something for us to go away and think about further do you still have questions um what have, has not been answered what what should we continue to explore the 
we get nothing, then I think we've definitely, yeah, we can definitely say it's been a job well done. How many hours of time is spent clearing permissions? That might be a bit of a depressing thing to calculate, but yeah, potentially interesting to know how much how much time is, is I was going to say wasted then, how much time is spent on this process and could that time be reduced? And so it could be used on other things. Uh, I think we, uh, there we go. I would like more clarity on what is considered commercial versus non-commercial. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Something we could think about. And it sounds like a lot of these, you know, when you really get into the detail of some of these questions, they do exist in a kind of gray area. Is there a business or service idea for supporting OA or non-commercial publishers? Interesting. Some worst case scenarios as reality checks. Okay. We can think about that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing because we're coming up to our um, hour. Um, I see there's been a lot of new comments in the chat, uh, so I hope there's no questions for me because I don't have time to read them. Um, thanks, everybody, so much uh, for coming and for giving us your attention and asking so many questions. Thank you enormously to our speakers um, who we gave them a really tough time limit and a, a tricky job. Um, and there was so much rich content in your presentations. And thank you also for engaging with the, the questions that we've had as well. Um, and thanks to, to Paula and to Silke and Andrea as well for so much help and work in organizing this session. I hope it was useful. Um, it sounds like it was useful to, to some of you, which is great. And we'll be sharing the recording and a blog post, as I've already mentioned, um, via the Open Access Books Network um, and via, I imagine, University of London Press as well, we'll be sharing it. Um, so yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and thanks very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.